Awesome job, everybody. Y'all can have a seat. Uh, thank y'all for gathering with us here today at Union Point Church. If it's your first time visiting with us, uh, we would love to meet you out at the tent. Uh, we got a gift we would love to give you and maybe answer any questions that you might have uh, about Union Point Church. Our mission here is simple. We're a family of local churches on mission to lift Jesus uh, and others in eastern North Carolina. If you're interested in giving that mission, you can do so in a couple different ways. You can give online. Uh, you can drop something physical in the black boxes as you leave, or you can give through the apps. Speaking of the apps, we got a couple of them. We got the Union Point Church app. Uh, that's your past, present sermon, con sermon content on there. Uh, we have started back in Mark. You can uh, go back and watch the entire rest of the Mark series on there. I'd invite you to do so. Um, it's, it's been a great uh, walkthrough for us. Uh, we also have the commu uh, uh, woo, community church app. Woo, I know. <laughs> church Center app. There we go. Words. On that, you can sign up for community groups. You can also sign up for Bible studies uh, and any of the events that we'll be talking about today. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I am super excited about today. Um, it is a special Sunday. What's happening to today? Anybody know? Baptism. Baptisms and baby dedications, right? It's a, such a great time to be able to look at a, a family who's dedicating their child, saying, hey, we're going to try to raise this child uh, in the way that God wants us to in the way that he's calling us to. By the way, that's not done by taking them to church. That's by living a life that's seeking after the Lord. So that's great to see. But man, is it good to see someone get baptized. It don't matter if it's a hot tub or not. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> to see them, uh, you know, die to the old self and be risen new is, is, is amazing. Uh, as far as announcements go, the exchange, that's our youth ministry. Uh, we, that is middle school and high school meets Sundays. Uh, from 6 to 8. Uh, come on out, have fun, play games, eat pizza. Uh, let's love and grow together. Heads up, it's Batman Valentine's Day. We're starting a series on love, marriage, singleness, and sex. So get ready for that, y'all. Can't wait to see you. It's going to be a great time. Um, no one's going to show up tonight, Jordan. Thanks. Real smart. First steps, if you guys have been coming to Union Point for a while, or maybe you haven't, you want to dip your toe in the water a little bit. Uh, first steps, we invite you to do that. You get to uh, learn a little bit about the church, talk to some leaders, uh, ask questions. It's a good time for that. That is February 25th, which is next Sunday, uh, during second service. Next week, also, year-end celebration. Uh, it's a time we look at this past year and all the great things God has done. Uh, give him glory, honor, and praise for that. But then we get to look toward the future. Uh, so it's a great time. The Rise Up Women's Conference, that's something that's being held down east at our east campus. Uh, very few spots remain, so if you're interested in that, women, uh, make sure you sign up through the Church Center app for that uh, because spots are limited. And then Men's Night, right? Manly, manly Night. We're going to do stuff. I don't know what, but roast meat, smoke meat. I don't know. There's going to be food, fellowship. Guys just get a chance to sit around, talk, eat good food. It's going to be a great time. Uh, that's on March 14th at 6.30, so we invite you to that. And then our Easter extravaganza is coming up. we got Italian ice. we got bounce houses for the kids, all that fun stuff. Uh, come learn what Easter is all about. So uh, I am surprised, just like you, that I'm allowed up here. It's not many, many Sundays you get to yeet a baby off the stage. Uh, but I want to talk to you about serving. Uh, you know, the church has been growing quite a bit. Uh, Point Peeps has 74 kids. we got more individuals coming in and out all the time. Oh, what is this? Oh, thank you, Amazon. What do y'all think's in here? A ba that, that's ridiculous. A baby. Who ships a baby in a package? Also, Amazon's got cheap. They don't take the packages anymore. So, uh, oh, man, look at this. Coffee cups. Look at that. My cup does not overflow because no one's here to fill my coffee. 
maybe kids aren't your thing. Maybe, and I get that. I have two of two, two myself. I'm just kidding. That's a joke. Uh, maybe kids aren't your thing. Point piece isn't your thing. Maybe you uh, have the gift of hospitality, gift of serving. Uh, we would love for you to talk to Miss Christy uh, about being on the welcome team, right? Uh, maybe you're good at filling up coffee. Maybe you're good at just smiling. Uh, maybe you're good at just saying hello. You know, that's great. Uh, we would love you there. And, and what is this? It's another baby. I got you. I'm not throwing a baby on baby dedication. And, of course, Port Point Peeps. We'd love for you guys uh, to volunteer for Point Peeps again. Uh, so at this time, we're going to pray. We're actually going to ask the families who are dedicating uh, their children to come on up here. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your love for us, the fact that, um, you know, no matter where we're at in our lives, uh, we can always strive to seek after you because you're right beside us. I uh, just ask you to be with today's service. Uh, we give you glory and honor for all things. Amen, amen. Oh, man. Good morning, church. How about, how about these beauties coming up? Slide down here to y'all's right as much as you can. We got a whole choir happening here. <laughs> How about this? Uh, church, it's always a good thing when you can celebrate young lives being dedicated to being raised in the faith, but as well, new lives being baptized into the kingdom. I mean, how awesome is that that we get to do that today? So, families, the scripture says to train up a child in the way they should go and they'll never depart. Uh, I was told recently by a good friend of mine, that sometimes we get that scripture way confused. Uh, it's not you're training them towards something that you're unsure of. It's that you find out the way they should go, and who is it that we find the way they should go in? Jesus. And then we train them up in that. We want them to live according to everything that God has for them, everything he's made them for. And you as a family, that's your first role and duty, to raise them in a family that loves Jesus that demonstrates what walking with him looks like, that encourages them in grace, that when they make mistakes, are they going to make mistakes? I'm still making them. When they make mistakes, they find a firm hand of compassion, correction, and discipline. So make sure that you train them in the way they should go. As a parent myself, I'm telling you, not only will your kids make mistakes, but you're going to. You're going to do things at times that you're like, man, I wish I hadn't done that. Can I tell you the quickest way to demonstrate what being a follower of Jesus looks like in your family? Is as your kids get older, when you make a mistake, you own it. Son or daughter, I'm sorry that I said that or said this thing or spoke this way. We got a fire truck coming through here? What is that? Dale, are you, what are you doing over there? <laughs> Piano players, man. <laughs> okay, I'll own it. <laughs> Thanks, Pops. <clears throat> I got my jacket laid on my keyboard over here. And it must have moved. When you make mistakes, own them. Own them. <laughs> and uh, so we're here with you as a family. We're here with you as a church family. We're walking beside you, and we love you guys and believe in what God has ahead of you. So, Mandy. Thank you. My goodness, look at all these babies, y'all. Look how sweet they are. <laughs> We are so excited um, to, we are so excited about these babies and their families, and we're so glad you guys are here. This morning, I have the opportunity to read our responsibilities, so I'll start with the parents. 
So, parents, do you commit to raising this child of God, uh, of God in a home of gospel-centeredness, love, grace, mercy, and correction, a home seeking the presence of the Most High God above all else and build on the foundation of his word? If so, say we do. Awesome. All right, church, it's our turn. Do you, church, commit to loving, praying for, caring for, encouraging, and supporting these families in their efforts to disciple these future generations in the grace and love of Jesus? Do you commit to assisting them in these efforts by standing by them, affirming them, and equipping them as we are so called to by the word of God? If so, say we do. Well, church, stretch out your arm towards these families. And let's pray over them this morning. Jesus, thank you for the gift of new life. Lord, uh, for these families, I pray that you would give them wisdom, compassion, love, and care for the days ahead. Lord, just as they wrote the rose they hold in their hand, may they be reminded that the only way that they can truly be the parents you've called them to be is to have your spirit present in them. And so, Lord, help them to cultivate their relationship with you as they help their child learn what it means to cultivate that relationship with you. Lord, let us as a church to walk alongside them and encourage them and exhort them to continue on and press on in the good days and in the bad. And we just ask this in your name. Amen. Church, would you stand and let's continue in worship. Guys, you can step off to the side there.
don't know this one, so sing it out this morning.
round of applause for the worship team. Very good stuff. Well, good morning. Uh, wow, that was great. <laughs> um, my name is Charles Curtis. For those who don't know me, I'm on the, the teaching team here at uh, Union Point, and it's great to be with you this morning. Um, went a little long this morning. Uh, the first service, I'll try to keep it a little briefer. Who am I kidding? Just bear with me. Um, but yeah, it's great uh, to be here. And so today we are back in the Gospel of Mark. And today we're going to do the first 26 verses of chapter 8. That's a lot. But the title of the sermon, and I think this is what uh, the Lord had placed it upon me whenever I was studying this, is uh, the already not yet. And we'll, we'll get into that. What does it mean to live in the already not yet? And I think that this has some applications, and I think that's what Christ is teaching his disciples through his actions. And having it placed in the scripture where it is, just it just pops out at me. So um, the first part of this is Christ feeding the 4,000. Now, this is the second time in the Gospel of Mark that we see this. And in the synoptics, you'll see it in there twice. He feeds the 5,000, and he feeds the 4,000. In this particular case, they had been walking in the wilderness for a long time. And if you ever get a chance to take a look at this, there's some good biblical maps that have all kinds of different options, and there's one that shows Christ's ministry you can see that, that that was a long trek, and it was in the middle of nowhere. So here we are on the third day, and these folks are hungry, they're tired, and Jesus has compassion on them. And one of the things I told the first service this morning, um, preaching again on feeding the multitudes takes um, the, the skills of a preacher that I'm not gifted enough to do. I'll do the best I can. I sort of feel like Elizabeth Taylor, seventh husband with this. <laughs> I know what I'm supposed to do. I just don't know how I'm going to make it very interesting. So I'll do, with the help of the Lord, I'll do my best here. So let's go to the text and begin. Mark 8. And let's read beginning in verse 1. Where am I? Oh, no, I did it again. All right, bear with me here. I'll get there. All right, verse 1. In those days when, a, again, a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and he said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. Some of them have come from far away. And the disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. A lot of this looks like a similar situation to the 5,000. He took the seven loaves and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. In the Gospel of Matthew, it says 4,000 people, not including uh, women and children. Mark doesn't get into that detail here. And immediately, he got into the boat with his disciples, and they went to the district of Dalmanu. Um, there's a couple of things I want to mention about this because the bulk of what the teaching is going to be in the first half of chapter 8 is going to be what follows this. But I do want to mention a couple of things. One is whenever I read Christ feeding the multitude, he has compassion on them. They're weary and they're hungry. And what does he do? He feeds them. He performs a supernatural act and feeds 4,000 people who needed it. And it reminds me of Matthew chapter 6, 
where it says, you know, you worry about where you're going to eat, or what you're going to eat. You're going to have the next meal. You worry about your clothes. You worry about the roof over your head. And Jesus says, these are the things that the Gentiles worry about, but that's okay. What you need to do is to seek first the kingdom of God, remember this, and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added into you as well. So God is not just interested in only the spiritual parts. He gave you a body. He placed you on the earth. He knows exactly what you need physically, and he cares about that. So here we see Jesus performing this and reflecting his Father's will and his will in perfect harmony and caring for these people and giving them what they needed to nourish their bodies. But there's a second thing I wanted to bring up about this, is that in the first feeding, Christ was in an area that was mostly Jewish. Here, before he crosses over to Dalmanutha, he's in an area that's mostly Gentile. So I think it's also messaging here in this text that Jesus is beginning to show in this gospel that he is out to reclaim the nations, the Gentiles, who were disinherited by God in Genesis 11. Remember the Tower of Babel? You have to look at the Bible as one story. It's not a whole bunch of different ones. It has an underlying theme that binds it all together. So here in Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 10 we see the outward signs of God's Son reclaiming the nations that were disinherited so long ago in the Old Testament. How cool is that? But what does he do next? They get in the boat and they go over to Dalmanutha. And it's mainly a Jewish area again. So they're zigzagging back and forth across the sea here. So they're staying very busy. So they approach the Pharisees, and this is what I entitled as blind and bold. We're going to be dealing with blindness in this text and how blindness represents the already not yet for a believer of Jesus Christ. But before we get to the blind and the bewildered, we deal with the blind and the bold, who is represented by the Pharisees here. Now, beginning in verse 11, going through 13, it says this, The Pharisees came and began to argue with him. We've seen a lot of this. They don't like him. They don't like what he stands for. They don't like who he is. Seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. What kind of signs are they looking for? He just fed a bunch of people through supernatural, miraculous powers. He's done this in front of them before in other ways. But in the first century, the Jewish people were waiting for their Messiah. And they had their own expectations of what the Messiah would look like. And I'm sure what they were looking for are specific signs that they could go back and look at some second temple uh, literature that proposed what the Messiah would look like or what the Messiah would do. And they figured they would ask him to do the same thing, that kind of sign. It doesn't really matter. Their motivation is pretty much set in stone. And what did Jesus do? Verse 12, and he sighed deeply in his spirit, in response to their question. And he said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Now, in English, it's kind of hard to get this in its full impact, but in the original Greek, you see it. And I'm going to quote R.T. France here because he did a great commentary on Mark, and he says this, um, that the word for sighed deeply Anastanazo indicates his distress, not over physical complaint, but over the unresponsiveness of this generation. Not just the generation of the Pharisees, but the wider generation that are acting just like them. Uh, They revealed in in the demand for a, a sign when so many miracles had already testified to his unique authority. He goes on to say, After the strongly dismissive tone of verse 12 and in view of the change of focus in Jesus' ministry, which now follows, it seems better to take the phrase, um, and it's in Greek here, but I believe it is uh, a demand for a sign here. Um, Here is more strongly marked. That's the important part. This is Jesus' deliberate disengagement from discussion. 
with the Pharisees and the generation they represent. He gets into the boat to leave Galilee and its crowds in order to concentrate on instruction of the disciples who now go with him to the other side in the boat. It's important here because RT has basically given us the signal that this is the end of a section of the gospel where Jesus is basically going everywhere and dealing with crowds. And he's, he's seeing uh, both good responses and bad responses. And here, at this point, it's an inflection point. And what Jesus is doing here is that he's changing course and he's going to focus on the 12. And when you get to the last half of chapter 8, going forward, it's going to be Jesus teaching, loving, encouraging, and revealing to, who, to them who he is, which is the Messiah, the Son of God. But what he's doing here with these Pharisees is he's basically telling them, this is a pointless conversation. Bye. No point in it. I know what your hearts are. You're not looking for a sign. If I offered you 85 signs, it still wouldn't change it because you don't like me, you hate me, you consider me a threat, and you should. But this is a useless conversation. Goodbye. Now, it's a mistake to say that these people are hopeless. Don't look at it that way, because who knows? In Acts chapter 2, we see some of the Pharisees and the Sadducees actually become Christians. We don't know. Maybe some of these guys were. What he's saying is, is that this is pointless. Your minds are made up. You want your will, not God's. And they came in God's name, but they didn't want his will. If they did, they would have recognized Jesus for who he was. But they wanted their will. And that's how it works. God, I want my will. And God says, no, not your will, my will. And then you say, no, I want my will. And God says, okay. All right. And this is what Jesus is doing here. Bye. Reminds me of the tombstone meme. Well, bye. Those of you that know the movie. Have you ever had conversations with somebody who is hostile towards Christianity, to the church. I, I used to love apologetics as a new believer. I think the reason I liked it so much is I wanted to answer my own questions. But it, but it outwardly came across as, I'm going to show all of these skeptics exactly how true the scripture is. And one of the things that you run into immediately, and it's not just in proven scripture, but in any kind of conversation, there are some people that are just motivated against you. And any conversation to try to persuade them is a pointless conversation. And you need to just move on. Sometimes a conversation is uncomfortable, but it's necessary. But sometimes it's uncomfortable and it's pointless. So take a cue from Jesus here. And whenever you see that and you experience that, move on. Don't waste any more time with that stuff. <laughs> Listen to what Paul says describing this generation that Jesus is talking about. Romans 8, verses 5 through 8. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, I'm kind of reformed with, with soteriology, which is basically the doctrine of salvation. I believe what they call monergistic work of God in salvation. He did the work. I passively received it. There was nothing that I brought to the table. Actually, he brought me to the table. <laughs> so I can't even say that I brought myself to the table. But he did the work. He initiated it. I passively experienced, received what God did. Now, from my standpoint, I was engaged. I was a part of it. But there's nothing to explain who I was in 1995 to who I was in 1998 except the power of God because I didn't care about Christianity. I didn't care about the church. I thought all you guys were fools. And then in 98, all of a sudden, I'm studying apologetics, and I'm plugged into a, to a Baptist church. And How do you explain that? I mean, it wasn't a gradual thing. It was like, boom, there it is. So you can't look at anybody as hopeless, all right? You can't. I was hopeless, but here I am. 
good Lord, if some of my friends could, could see what I'm doing right now, hadn't talked to me in a long time, they would be like, what happened to you? But I know a lot of you guys are in the same boat. So the blind and the bold, these are people that you just have to pray that God does something to them. Now, he could use you in that process, and he probably has, but it's important for you to know that even if he does use you, there are times when you just have to say bye, and that's okay, because here you see Jesus doing it. I think sometimes we think we hang on too much. We got to do it. We got to do it. They, they, they haven't come over to our side yet. There's another argument. We No, you just walk away because they are blind and they are bold in their blindness. But you also have a second category of the blind. And in this case, it's the disciples beginning in verse 14. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. He's bringing in religion and politics into this time. The Herodians, basically a political party under Herod Antipas, who was his region of control was Galilee and Perea. They didn't like him either. You know, by this time, John the Baptist is already beheaded. They didn't like John the Baptist that much either. But here's Jesus warning them for both the political and the religious groups, you need to beware and watch out for them, for their leaven. Now, what does he mean by leaven here? Obviously, it's metaphorical. He's not technically or literally talking about yeast. He's talking about an attitude, a spiritual condition that not just stays within, but it spills out over. And... We don't know what Mark specifically meant by leaven because he didn't talk about it. But if you can go to the other Gospels, Matthew 16, the leaven represents bad teaching, heretical teaching. Jesus is saying, be careful of the leaven of the Pharisees. Their teaching's wrong. And in Luke 12, 1, he's talking about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. They say one thing, do something else. You know, you think about the hypocrisy that Jesus scolded them with in Matthew 23. You place burdens on people that you won't even lift a finger to help them with. He says, you go out and travel land and sea to find a proselyte, then you make him twice the son of hell as you are. That's the blind and the bold here. But he's telling his disciples to watch out. They're focused on bread, though. Verse 16, and they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. This is the comedy that you find in Scripture. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand, or are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see, and having ears, you do not hear, and do you not remember? He's quoting Isaiah 6, 9-10. And if you go there, what you'll find out is this is Isaiah's commissioning by God before his divine counsel to be his spokesperson for Israel. And he, what he said, here's what you're going to tell them. Having eyes, you don't see. Having ears, you're not listening. If you did see and listen, you would turn and repent and I would heal you or I would restore you. He's saying this to his disciples. That's kind of harsh. Verse 19, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you, do you not yet understand? Could have gone on. He says, how many did I feed the first time? 5,000. How many did I feed the last time? 4,000. All right, I said, 9,000 people were on a boat, and you have one loaf, and you're worried. What is wrong with you people? It's Jesus is real here. He's talking to his own followers in, in somewhat harsh terms. But sometimes it's, they needed to hear it. They're arguing with themselves, probably blaming some poor soul. He was responsible for bringing more than one loaf. And look what we got. And Jesus is basically telling them, hey, straighten up.
So that's the blind and the bewildered. They follow Jesus. They're in the boat with him. They're going wherever he goes. Whatever he asks them to do, they do it. But they're still blind. Do you feel like that sometimes? How long have we been following him now? 97, 97, a long time. I still feel like I'm them sometimes. And as you're going to find out, that's all right. So they get on the other side. Well, in this case, it's, it's northeast. Now they take a little jaunt, and they're heading towards a town called Bethsaida. And beginning in verse 22, And some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had spat on or spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Have you ever, you know, had poor eyesight or you, you, you squinted your eyes and everybody that's around you kind of looks like a tree? You can kind of see what he's saying here. But that's all he could see. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not ever even enter the village. Do you think that Jesus had to do it the second time because the first time just didn't work out well? Or do you think Jesus is doing this two times to try to teach something to his disciples on the boat who are complaining about the bread? Do you think he's also trying to teach you and me something here? It has to do something with blindness, right? Obviously. When you get to chapter 10, you're going to meet uh, blind Bartimaeus. Different kind of scenario with blind Bartimaeus. When they get there, he doesn't have a group of people bringing him up to him. He's screaming to the top of his lungs from the crowd, Son of David! Jesus! Help me! Heal me! And he keeps doing this, and Jesus says, Bring him on over. That time he healed his blindness, and he had perfect vision right off the bat. Do you see the difference between the two? This is about faith. It's about trust. Do we trust him? Do we trust him with the bread? Do we trust him with things like our sight? Do you see where this is going here? And this is where I see in the Gospel of Mark, as well as elsewhere, a demonstration of what it is to be a, an apprentice of Jesus Christ is living in the tension of the already, but the not yet. In theological circles, they have the term called inaugurated eschatology. It's a fancy term that basically means that when Jesus in his incarnated body arrived on the scene, he ushered in or inaugurated the kingdom of God. Remember in Mark 1? Repent, for the kingdom of God is near or here. Believe in the gospel of the kingdom. So in that sense, the kingdom has arrived. It is here and it's available for you and for me and for everybody. This is the kingdom now. But if you get to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8, he says at this present time, we currently don't see everything in submission to him. So obviously the kingdom is not here also. It's here, but it's not here. Yes, it's here, and it's here through Jesus. And there's a church here that demonstrates throughout all of history that Jesus has been here and his kingdom is here. But it's not yet. There's still a lot of people that are in rebellion against him. There's systems in rebellion against him. There are spiritual forces that are in rebellion against him. They have been defeated at the cross, but their atrophy is in place. That means that they, they're losing their delegitimized power over time. So why do we have this time in between the not yet and the already? Well, what does it say? Paul says, the fullness of the Gentiles. What do you think the Great Commission was about? It's reclaiming all of those nations that were disinherited. And God knows when that, God the Father knows when that happens. When the fullness of the Gentiles are, is here. And he basically goes into about how all, all Israel will be saved. So when is that? Nobody knows. How long does it take? 
is it, is it set in stone or do we have um, a way to make that last longer or shorten it? The answer to both of those questions is yes. God is sovereign. We're responsible. If you ask me, how do you, how do you explain that? I can't, but it's true. They're both true. So that's the already and the not yet. But guess what, folks? It applies to us as well. It applied to the disciples on that boat. They were already his disciples, but they were not yet able to see what he's all about and what is, what's going on. The blind man, he could kind of see, but not perfectly, and he had to do it twice. Not because he didn't have enough power to do it, but he wants to demonstrate to the disciples, this is a process, folks. You come to me as a disciple, you're not fixed 100%. You're still messed up. It's a process. It's the already that you are mine, but it's the not yet. You're not where you're going to be when I'm done with you. And that is an important teaching, I believe, that we're seeing here. So the already sees, still blind, that's me, that's you, that's everybody. Now, some of you might say, you might say well, what about Acts chapter 2? The reason why they were blind and they couldn't see and we had all these issues with the disciples, is because God hadn't given his spirit to them yet like he did in Acts 2. So once you get past Acts 2, all the disciples are well-adjusted men of God, right? Have you read Galatians chapter 2? Paul scolds, I mean, he burns Peter. And when you read what he says about Peter, you don't like Peter. <laughs> He says, you show up here with all your good old friends from the circumcision group and you pretend like you're a good Jew. But when they're not here, you eat with Gentiles. And yet you want all the Gentiles to act like Jews? Who do you think you are? You're a hypocrite. Just like the Pharisees were a hypocrite. Peter was a work in progress. That doesn't mean that God couldn't use him and God did use him mightily. His letters and his epistles in the New Testament are amazing. Amazing. And Paul had his issues too. If you read 2 Corinthians, towards the end of that letter, you see him almost become neurotic. Let me tell you something about Paul. I think Paul was wealthy. Why? Because he's very educated. And you could not read and write and be very educated and know about the Greek and Roman poets unless you were rich. So what I see in Paul is somebody who gave all that up. Maybe he, used, maybe he liquidated everything he had and he used all of that for what? For the service of others, to go out and plant churches and to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ and make new disciples. And when they didn't do it, whenever they fell back into the circumcision party and thought that circumcision was necessary, or when they were listening to the super apostles who were heavily pedigreed and we're talking bad about Paul don't listen to him well if you were me I would say oh you're not going to listen to me well fine don't listen to me not Paul I love you guys I care for you they don't it's almost like he had absolutely no ego left made himself totally vulnerable to these people as bad as they acted but he loved them that's what I see in Paul and it's good to take a, a picture of that and use that when you're reading Paul's letters. Because these people were blind. They already could see Jesus as Lord and Savior, but they still had a long way to go. So one of the problems with the church, obviously, is that whenever any given day, this is me talking, okay? Let me, just, let me just start this off. I need to start this off this way. The strongest connections that I have made with people in a church has been here. My community group, everybody, people, my community group loves me, and I love everybody in my community group. That's what they're for, by the way, making connections. And those connections growing. I don't know where I was going with that now. I just drew a blank. But we're, yeah, that's where it was. We, too many times we focus on the already. I drive down I-40 and I see billboards of honey, shiny, happy people with their arms around each other inviting you to come to their church. 
And it's, it gives you the, the aura, like if you come here, you're going to be happy and shiny and you're going to be smiling like we are. I have sat under preaching where it made me feel guilty because I wasn't happy. That no matter how bad things were or could have gotten for me, I have no excuse but to be full of joy and always smiling. That's focusing on the already, and it's totally neglecting the not yet. Whenever you're going through hell and you walk into a body of believers, the last thing in the world that you want to feel is guilty for feeling that way. Where is that scripturally? We are meant to serve others. And that means that we be there. What does Paul say? When, when, we're in jo- when they're joyous, we're joyous. When they're crying, we're crying. We are with them. Honestly, authentically, and that will grow in Christ over time. So we have to focus on the not yet, but let's, let's talk about the already before we get to the not yet. There are two verses that I think really demonstrate the already. The first one is in Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. I think about Romans Romans 3. Like, through Christ shed blood, the righteousness of God, remember this, was revealed apart from Torah, apart from the law. Jesus Christ died on the cross to atone for our sins to make us acceptable and presentable towards a righteous and holy God. Now, there are different views of, of, of what Christ accomplished on the cross. There's that one, is the, the, the atonement that relates to uh, substitutionary atonement. But he also did other things, too. There's a, there's a view called uh, Christus Victor. He rescued us from what? Death. You and I, in Christ, will never see death or taste death. Our bodies will die. But we don't, because you are not a body. You have a body. And when it dies, you're in, his, you're in his presence, face to face. You will never taste death. Christ defeated death on the cross. He also defeated all of those spirits that run the nations now. Well, why are they still running all the nations? They're obviously running all the nations. You talk about things that are not under his submission. Give me a break. But he delegitimized them on the cross. Colossians 2.15, the most ironic passage in all of Scripture is that while he's nailed to a piece of wood, bleeding and dying, Paul says what? He made a spectacle of the principalities and powers and thrones. They didn't see it coming. He came to die for his enemies. That's the righteousness of God apart from the Torah, revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Some of those people that nailed him to a cross accepted him later as Lord and Savior. How cool is that? That's the already. So what does he do? He forgives our sins. He became sin so that we can be reconciled to the Father. He gives us his spirit. In the farewell discourse in the Gospel of John 14 through 16, Jesus talks about that I must depart and go to the Father to give you the spirit. He calls the spirit the parakletos. And that's a great word for it because it means comforter. It means teacher. It means friend. How many times he says, I don't need a teacher. I just need a friend. I don't just need someone who loves me and does all the things. I need somebody who likes me. How cool is that? We have that. And not only does the Spirit accomplish that for us, we have God dwelling within us, Father, Son, and Spirit dwelling within us. That makes us holy, sacred space. There's no need for a temple anymore. Christ was the sacred space. And for all of us who place our confidence, our loyal faith in Christ, guess what? We get his Spirit. We become sacred space. That's why Scripture describes you individually and me 
And as corporate as the body of Christ, or the temple of God, or the house of God, he's not just playing with words, he's describing to you some theological heavy truths that you are now sacred. That's why they call us saints. I hate the translation saint. That is not what the Greek says. You know what the Greek says for saint? Holy ones. Hagioi. You and I are holy ones. You know, in the Old Testament, with, with maybe one exception in Deuteronomy 33, the only time holy ones is ever used is to represent the host of heaven, his counsel. Do you see the lights click on here? Through Christ, his spirit dwells within us, and guess what? We are members of his counsel now. We will be forever, but before we die, we're still members. What do you think prayer is? You are able to, to participate in God's kingdom with God as a member of his counsel. And someday, you're not even going to realize what that's going to entail, but right now, you're a part of it now, too. That's the already. But there's the not yet. I skipped one. I did it first service. I did it again here. The second already verse that everybody uses all the time is 2 Corinthians 5.17. All of you have heard this. Oh, I've heard it. It was beaten over my head. Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in, the, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting us to us the message of reconciliation. You've heard that before? You're a new creation. So what's the problem? And you are a new creation. But that verse has been misinterpreted and misapplied so many times. Because why? We ignore the not yet. You think Paul ignored the not yet? You think Peter did? You think these guys planting churches in the first century and dealing with all of the human elements that they were dealing with, that there was no worries, no problems? And contrary to the billboards on I-40, do you think we have problems? That's rhetorical, by the way. <laughs> we are already a new creation, and that is very much true. But Paul spends a lot of attention on what he calls the old self and the new self. And not just in one letter, but many letters. Well, what is the old self and the new self? I didn't mention this first service. This is where the, uh, the new creation thing misinterprets it. Paul always brings up old self and new self because if you go to chapter 6 in Romans, it's on the heels of chapter 5 of Romans. Well, what does he talk about in the last half of chapter 5 of Romans? The first Adam and the second Adam, which is Christ. So what does he say? In the first Adam, he sinned and brought in death. And then he says, because everyone sins, everyone dies. From Adam to Moses and even afterwards. But in Christ, the second Adam, what? We have grace. We have favor. We have power. So what Paul is saying when he says old self and new self, he's referring you back to Romans chapter 5, talking about the first Adam and the second Adam. Why is that important? Because we have a tendency to follow both. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 21 through 24. Assuming that you have heard about him, that is Jesus, and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, put off your old self. Greek word is to strip away, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Reminds you of Romans 12, right? And to what? Put on or clothe yourself on the, new, on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And in Colossians 3, he says to clothe yourself in Christ. It means the same thing. Why would he teach this in Ephesians 4, Romans 6, 
Galatians 5 and Colossians 3 unless this was not important. Unless the, the not yet was vital and needed to be dealt with. Folks, I'm messed up. I'm better than I was, I think. Some days I think I've conquered something and I haven't. But I'm not a fool. I'm not thinking the rest of you got it all together and I don't. I'm the oddball. That's narcissistic. And we all have those tendencies too. But I have this constant battle between the old self and the new self. But we don't have to worry about the struggle. You want to know how come we don't preach on this too much anymore? Because when we were kids or maybe young adults or new in our walk with Christ, we heard a pastor who was a legalist and he abused the scripture and he traumatized us, made us feel like garbage. Or we had a Sunday school teacher, you name it. What we're hearing are the voices of those people in Paul's writings, not Paul and not the spirit of God. So let me challenge you this. Focus on these texts. These are the ones. Put off. What does he want you to put off? Well, he wants you to put off the flesh. Now, when he means flesh, what is he talking about? The word is sarx. It doesn't mean your skin or your epidermis. He's talking about a natural human capacity, and it's not a good one. It has a moral, a negative moral connotation to it. Well, what is the flesh? He describes it as, as jealous, angry, deceitful, greedy, sexually immoral. By the way, sexual immorality is also big, what he's talking about. It seems like they had a problem with that more than anything else because he's always hitting on that. And in the order, that's number one. We understand that. But the flesh, what Paul's talking about, I guess the best way to describe it would be the human endocrine system. Paul didn't know what an endocrine system was. We do, right? It's just like a, it's a network of glands that emit hormones. And there's hormones associated with anger, hormones associated with fear, love, passion, sadness, depression. Here's the thing about our endocrine system. It is necessary for the human body, but it can make a wonderful servant and a tyrannical master. And when it's a tyrannical master, which is what we are, we are slaves to our endocrine system. Somebody raises a fist to punch me, what am I going to do? I'm going to make a fist. Somebody badmouths me, somebody badmouths, I mean, I'm telling you, you just go down the list. We have had a whole life of learning how to let our endocrine system tell us what to do in every scenario. And Paul's saying, you don't have to do that anymore. You have been set free. Well, sometimes it don't feel like I am free from it, Paul. But you are. That doesn't change it. If you felt it, it was probably you in the first place, not the Holy Spirit. And what Paul's telling you, it's the Holy Spirit, walking in the Spirit. Now, to walk, peripatao, doesn't mean just like walking, you know. It actually, ironically, means to remain stable. Like wherever it is that you're walking around, you're absorbing the environment you're in. And what Paul's saying, you can walk according to the flesh or you can walk according to the spirit. And as believers in Jesus Christ, just like those apostles on the boat, we can do either one of those things. And we do both of those things. So why is it important for us to focus on this whole teaching of the not yet? Well, it's not to be a downer. I've always told people after I got saved, I had the hardest time belonging to a church. Church just as a culture is really hard for me. And I couldn't really put it in terms. And I'm not talking about Union Point. I'm just talking about my entire church experience. I think one of the biggest problems is the, the relationship seems superficial to me. And I think the reason, and you know what, I've, I have generated and been at fault for superficial uh, relationships too. But this is the focus on the already and presenting ourselves as somebody that we're really not, not yet anyway. We want to push aside all the struggles and present ourselves as we will be, and we're not there yet. So what's the one thing that is important for us to remember as believers? 
using Scripture as our truth and our guide, we're free to fail. You have freedom to mess it up, and you will mess it up. Let me tell you something about church. I just gave you a negative of it. Every church is messed up, including this one. But I'm telling you right now, right here in the pulpit, there's a lot of wonderful things about this group, and I love them. That's why I'm here. But I don't think that they've made it. I haven't made it. Listen, there are people out there that know me, and they love me, but I irritate them. I say things I'm not supposed to say. I, I don't do things that I really ought to do, and then I do things I'm really not supposed to do. And it makes people mad. In some cases, it hurts people. And a lot of times, I don't get an opportunity to even know that I did it. Sometimes they do let me know. If they love me enough, they'll let me know. And I'm sorry. I never meant to hurt anyone. But I did, and I do. I don't care where you go to church. If you don't have that in your head about yourself and the people that you're gathering with to worship God, get ready for utter disappointment. That's because you didn't even want to talk about the not yet. And a lot of times it's our fault, and a lot of times the church doesn't want to show you the not yet. Of course they don't. That's bad PR. We're all holding hands and walking off in the sunset with pots of gold. <laughs> no, you're not. We have freedom to fail. Listen to uh, Romans 5, 9 through 10. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, we've been made right with God through the blood of Jesus. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his sons, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Not only did his death save us, his life is continually saving us. I'm messed up, but you know what? Get used to me because you're going to be spending the rest of eternity with me. <laughs> and I'm not going to be the same guy, and neither are you. Because through his life, I'm being saved. Salvation is I'm saved, I'm being saved, and I will be saved. We have to remember all three of those, those, those tenses. Listen to Romans 7, 4 through 6. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law, through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law, that's what the law does, by the way. Trying to be good makes you worse. We're at work in the members of, of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we can serve in the new way of the Spirit and not live in the old way of the written code. You're also going to bear fruit. And you're living in the not yet. What is some of that fruit that you bear? Paul talks about it in every one of those teachings. Patience. We got to be patient with each other. Forbearance. How many times is this person going to come up to me with the same problem? Doesn't matter. How many times am I going to have to go to them with the same problem? Forbearance. That's a fruit of the Spirit. That doesn't come from you. That comes from God. His Spirit dwells within you. Do you see what I'm talking about? There was a there was a uh, uh, commercial from the Super Bowl that was really controversial. Uh, he gets us. You guys know about he gets us. All right. Let me tell you something about that. Yeah, it only tells part of the story. Yeah, they were kind of selective in how they did it. But I understand what they were trying to do. If you can get if you could reach millions of people in the Super Bowl about Jesus, even if it's partial, and start a conversation about Jesus, then why not? But what do we do? That's only half the story. Okay, right, it's only half the story. 
we have a tendency to jump right back in the flesh thinking that we're not in the flesh and bang our trash can lid. You know, probably the people out there, they're not even believers. You don't know that. And I'm not saying that they weren't operating in the flesh when they put it together either. All I'm saying is, is pick and choose your battles. Focus on the mission. Go out and make disciples. Can you make disciples by just ticking everybody off, trying to control their behavior all the time? That's God's part of this thing, not yours. We have freedom to fail. And that is part of the already. And we need to grasp that. You cannot grasp the not yet without understanding what you have already. And one of them is that you can fail and he ain't leaving you. You can fail big and he's got you. That's the power of the shed blood of Christ, by the way. How powerful is it? It's more powerful than the worst thing you could do. And you belong to him. Now, can you walk away? I don't know. There's a lot of teaching in Hebrews that makes you think that that's possible. I don't know how. Like Peter, where are we going to go? You have the words of life. (laughs) But he isn't going to leave you. You can't lose what you never earned in the first place. It was given to you. It is your life. It's not I that lives, but Christ who lives in me. So how does this work for us as a church? Last slide, promise. Let's focus on the put on. And there are three things that I think for our church corporately and for us individually is honesty, transparency, and here's a big one, vulnerability. There's all kinds of things about myself that I don't want other people to know about. And you're the same way. We have to be vulnerable before others. If you want to see a church grow stronger and the connections grow stronger, we have to place relationship above reputation. And you can't do that without walking in the Spirit and putting on or clothing yourself in Christ Jesus. We have an opportunity to do this. Always do. Sometimes we fail. We, sometimes we fail big. But that opportunity is still there. You may go to a church, be disappointed, go someplace else. Look, the connections weren't strong. They were superficial. Can we we approach the table today after the baptisms? Let's make a point to put on, clothe ourselves with Christ, recognizing that we still have a tendency and we still have the old self to deal with. And that we want the Lord to help foster and grow real relationships, strong relationships. Relationships where if you're not doing something right, instead of bolting, you say, I'm sorry. Do you want that? I do too. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you've given us in the already but not yet. And we walk with you in that, knowing that you're there and you'll never leave us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Kenny, you and the boys, Cameron and Joseph this morning. Cool little story here, church. Mr. Kenny, who's standing up right here, he's he's not gifted in height. It was my third grade Sunday school teacher. How about that? That's pretty cool, ain't it? (laughs) so boys we celebrate baptism as this that this is an outward sign of an inward work that God has done in your life Um, but also baptism is a sign is significant because it is our proclamation and declaration that we're going to live for the king the king of the kingdom Jesus And so it's a sign of your allegiance. Now, the crazy thing is you're saying when you go in the water, I identify in Jesus' death. But then when you're coming out, you're also saying I'm identified in his resurrection. Because he's alive, so will I be even when I die. Even more so, though, what you're saying is when I come out of this water, I'm going to live as a servant in the king's army. 
And so when you come out of the water, here's what I can promise you. You're going to feel the battle. You're going to feel the war. You're going to feel that tension of what Charlie's talked about today. Some of the old ways in the past. And the enemy's going to come in in a sly way, try to convince you something other than what you have proclaimed. Let me encourage you in this. When you feel that, number one, you've got Christ with you. But to number two, know that that's assurance that you're with him. He wouldn't be coming against you if you weren't with the king. And so this morning as you do this, just be reminded of that. Church, you're here to walk beside these young gentlemen. Amen. They're in the kingdom, and they're walking faithfully, and that's what we're signifying today. So, boys, we're with you in the midst of it, okay? So, whichever one wants to go first. Dad, do you want to lead them? You can say whatever, bro. Just hold the mic. It's really special to see Riley the last few months. He has fallen more and more in love with God. And what's really crazy is he was down there asking us questions. And Cameron was sitting on the sofa. And we were just having a good, deep conversation. And, and Cameron's taking this in. And, and Cameron's like, I don't really know if, if I know Jesus as my Savior. This was about three weeks ago. And uh, so we prayed with them. We didn't with brother. All right. You, you want to say anything or? Okay. <laughs> Lead him, Dad. All right. Riley, have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Yes. Do you know that you that you're going to heaven? You do. Right. Riley told us that uh, he was baptized what a few years ago, or several, probably three or four years ago, and he says, "I want to be baptized again because I didn't really know what it meant then." He knows what it means now. And he's following Jesus. All right. You kneel down. Kneel down. <laughs> Riley, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, I baptize you. Cameron, we've talked several times, right? And you know your your walk is just starting, okay? And you do understand what this means, right? You are you believe Jesus died for your sin. You've asked him to come to your heart, right? And you know you're going to heaven. Awesome. All right. Cameron, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I baptize you. In that good church, amen. Well, let's stand up, let's pray, and then the band's going to lead us in a last song. We invite you to come to the table, partake of communion, and just thank you for being here today, amen. Jesus, thank you for new life. Thank you for the celebration that we've had this morning. And Lord, I pray as we come to the table, we would lay so many things down so we can pick up everything you have ahead of us. And so we ask that this morning in your name. Amen.